Cast. Yeah, the truth is, I mean, I guess it's bad to admit it, but like, I hate salespeople. I just hate them. And that's why whenever I had to do sales, which I've had to do sales most of my life, I always tried to avoid being that typical salespeople. And that's kind of how we created our pricing model that we, well, I mean, I guess I decided to not make money percentage wise from what we charge people. Because naturally, if you charge for something more expensive, I would make more money, which technically could be okay, but I didn't want that to be the case. Welcome to Think Business with Tyler, sharing our methods and strategies for success. Join in on our conversations with business owners as we highlight their triumphs and detail how they overcame the challenges they faced while continuing to grow and scale their business. It's time to think life, think success, and think business with your host, Tyler Martin. Welcome to Think Business with Tyler, the podcast where entrepreneurs and business owners come to get strategic insights for their ventures. I'm your host, Tyler Martin, and today we have an exceptional guest, Jaime Nakach, CEO of Virtual Latinos. In this episode, Jaime reveals how a simple deposit strategy transformed his client interactions and why turning down difficult clients can actually save you time and money. We'll dig into his unique approach to integrating virtual professionals as true team members and how this has set his company apart in the competitive recruitment industry. If you've ever struggled with client management or wondered how to effectively leverage global talent without sacrificing quality, you won't want to miss this conversation. Stick around for some game-changing tips and insights. Hey, Haima, welcome to the Think Business with Tyler podcast show. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Did I get your first name right? Yes. <laughs> I that. That's good enough. <laughs> I had to work on it, man. It's, it's a great name, by the way. Thanks. Well, first, welcome to the show. I sure appreciate you being here. And I do kind of want to set up uh, the reason that I'm so excited to have you here. You know, virtual professionals, virtual assistants, I mean, I get probably five emails a day, it seems, and messages okay. for virtual assistants. It's a very crowded market. But what I really love in researching your company before, you know, we decided to have you on the show and you decided to accept was just the fact that you guys are really differentiating. One, I think you're in a different location that we're seeing more and more in terms of where your virtual folks are coming from. But two, you really have dis- differentiated your model, I believe, in the way I view you and the way you guys have even marketed to me. So I kind of really want to get into that. So I kind of already said what you do, but if you could would share, tell me a little bit about your business, what you do, and then I'd also love to learn a little bit about what you do personally. Sure. So I'm Jaime. I'm the founder and CEO of Virtual Antinos. Uh, but I really consider myself, uh, at least originally speaking, to be a marketer. I've been doing digital marketing for over 20 years at this point. Started with building websites. But yeah, today I guess I am a recruitment agency, which I am. Uh, and I always say it like that because I didn't really think we'll plan necessarily, you know, to be in the recruitment space. But now I am and I love it. So yeah, uh, we manage a pretty big team of people that manage the company that help uh, basically connect amazing uh, talented professionals from Latin America with uh, companies here in the U.S. And the sweet spot in terms of people is usually, sorry, in terms of businesses is usually companies that have between five to 15 people already. Uh, we still you know, help solopreneurs, but they tend to be harder to work with because they're less prepared. But yeah, we've been uh, doing this for six years now. So I started this model in 2018. And yeah, we've been very you know, grateful to be able to help so many people on both sides, both in North and South America. So yeah, I've been happy running this agency and continuing to grow. Gosh, there's so much I want to ask you. But before I do, what about personally? Do you have any personal interests that you're, you can share? Yeah, I love in general the outdoors. I love uh, going out and hiking and I love uh, snowboarding, which is about two, well, three hours here from San Diego at a place called Big Bear, uh, where I was doing recently. But generally speaking, I really enjoy mostly just being with family. Uh, I really always look forward to just spending down with my both my nuclear family and the rest of my family when they're around. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. But generally speaking, I really enjoy mostly just being with family. Uh, I really always look forward to just spending down with my, both my nuclear family and the rest of my family when they're around. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's get into the business. You know, it is a crowded market. Like there are just 
it seems like everybody's offering virtual services now. What do you think is your differentiator? What do you guys do that is a little bit different? It's interesting because you called yourself a recruiting firm. A lot of times they don't they don't call themselves that. And, and so I'm just curious, how do you differentiate? How do you think of yourself as a recruiting firm? Do the virtual people stay actually on your payroll or do they ultimately convert? over to the client, what's that look like? Sure. So, I mean, I guess I'll tell you a little bit of personal background. So, you know, when I started the company, I didn't think of creating a company. I mostly realized that I wanted to hire people that were not in the Philippines, because I was already hiring people people in the Philippines. And that's when I already decided that I wanted to cut my costs and not have my entire team in the United States, which I did at the time for my marketing agency. And then I was actually quite surprised that nobody by 2018 had offered any assistance and professionals from Latin America. I had only been one company called You Assist Me, which worked like a BPO model, everybody working from one location in El Salvador. So I was both scared or amazed that it was either a huge amazing opportunity, or I'm like, there's prior reason nobody been doing it. There's like the Filipinos have been doing this for like 20 years, and the companies are many of American companies. So I, I was both perplexed and excited. So definitely the fact that I was exploring something new and nobody was offering it, uh, at the time, was definitely a unique differentiator. Uh, it unfortunately no longer is in terms of just operating people from Latin America, because now many people have complicated. I guess people realize, oh, hey, these guys are doing it, maybe we should do it too. And there's more people that are competing in space. I will tell you that one of the things that for me was important that we created from, from the beginning was the fact that many, many times virtual assistants, not always, are considered by people who hire them just like freelancers that are going to hire for like, cheap labor. And yes, of course, the idea that you're hiring them is because they're more affordable. But in our case, we only take on both people that are in Latin America and clients. We're looking to really add people into their teams for long-term relationships. So that's a key uh, first part. Uh, so both the way that we you know, work with them and when we intake them, we want to make sure that everybody's really looking to become part of a company. And the companies treat them even though they're not legally employees to keep them as employees and make them part of their team, that they respect them in the same way as everybody else. And that's usually where the successful clients we work with, you know, are able to stay with us longer. And they do treat people uh, in the same way. But, you know, another key differentiator of what we did uh, differently, the fact that we built a community. So uh, typically most uh, virtual assistant companies, you know, usually will come in terms of attract clients, they'll talk to them, and they they already have a bunch of people who they already have in touch with. Or they'll post a job somewhere on the local job board and then try to attract those people and do the recruitment as the clients come in, let's say. Uh, the, the model we built was different. I really wanted to build first a community where people were able to interact with each other and that they were going to be pre-vetted first. And then once this community of people were pre-vetted, then we would only hire from this specific community, right? So this is something different than, you know, some other companies also do it, but it's not as common. So all of our professionals have been highly pre-vetted initially. And they represent only 5% of the people who want to work with us. We only accept, well, at this point, definitely less than 5%. And then we only hire from that pool of people, right? So we already basically, yes, we invested a lot of time up front to make sure that these people were good. Now, not for any one specific job, because we hired for lots of roles, but it's people that are very good in terms of being professional, being on time, uh, being detail-oriented, most of them or many of them being very proactive. We basically make it very hard to get in on purpose because we want to make sure that we only get the best. And then we get from that tool, right? So that's kind of something that's very unique to us. Now, there's obviously many other benefits I could talk about how our company is different in terms of hiring from Latin America versus the Philippines or somewhere else. But those are the two key things. Yeah, I am curious. Like, how how do you find, like, do you have boots on the ground? Do you actually have people or offices in uh, Latin America or is it all remote? And No, it's all remote. Wow. Uh, People have asked me, like, so do you travel and go these places? I'm like, I'd love to, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just go to Mexico City to visit my father who lives there, but they're just, you know, for family stuff. No, so because I guess I have my digital marketing background, I did the whole thing digitally. And until today, we still haven't done anything in person in any of these countries, at least not officially to recruit anybody. So it's all digital, you know, through marketing and through referrals. Okay. And, you know, traditionally, you know, if you asked me three, maybe five years ago, you know, Latin America, you were going to provide virtual professionals from Latin America. I'd think, wow, 
you know, are they educated? Kind of how you tend to think of Philippines. I mean, Philippines, their English skills tend to be better than a lot of Americans, sometimes even better than my own, uh, you know, the way they write and the way they interact. And it, it's very seamless. So I would, I didn't generally think of that way until I started to work with people from Latin America. I mean, how did you know that, I mean, ha- have you had to invest in education in terms of getting them up to speed or did you already, are they already there? Or just curious. Yes or not. Look, you know, as a person who is from Mexico City myself and growing up in Mexico, I mean, I happen to be lucky and my parents taught me English when I was seven before I moved to the U.S. But, um, you know, it was kind of a thing that people in Mexico City don't speak English. And it's usually true for most of Latin America. Now, I've also separately have been lucky to travel almost every country in Southeast Asia, probably not except the Philippines. And a lot of people speak English in Southeast Asia. And I'm saying like the typical person that's going to be, I don't know, on a fast food stand on the street or on a 7-Eleven or stuff like that, people tend to be a little, let's say, more English educated right now. The reality is I also know that because I, I you know, have a lot of friends in Mexico that, of course, there's a lot of people that are obviously going to school, have college degrees, master's degrees. And, you know, that, let's call part of society that is educated. There's a lot of very educated people, and many of them, or most of them, do speak English. So, you know, that and that is the type of people that we're attracting, right? The college-educated people, the people that already grew up, probably going to a bilingual school. And so, yeah, I mean, the truth is, I didn't, like, obviously... Well, not only, but I did not necessarily got at the time. I was just hoping, well, you know, I'm going to just try it and see if it works. I didn't try to build the business knowing it'll actually for sure work, but, uh, which is why I invested very little money initially. But then, you know, even though the English skills do exist, I, you know, that is currently, I think, our main challenge. And I was just speaking about this yesterday with our team that as we continue to grow as a company and now have more competitors, the supply of how many Latin Americans exist in Latin America that speak very good English is very limited compared to Asia, right? So people really, that's the thing where we need to invest on people learning English better or having a better English fluency so that they can work. But the professional part, I'm not afraid of because there's lots of professionals with lots of great, you know, titles and experience and skills. So that part's not, but the English is really the main thing that is missing. Now, when it comes to, for example, more American-based, let's call it, in this case, what I know, marketing skills, that was my biggest challenge, finding people that already knew American-based, let's say, digital marketing and like all the things that we know in the U.S. because I, I was in space. Uh, and Latin America, for the most part, is always years behind. You know, just like the movies used to be behind back in the day, Latin America now, you know, the, the, many of the skills that people know, at least marketing-wise in the U.S., are still very much lagging in Latin America. So we are having to invest in doing those trainings and help people. Now, we're not focusing on marketing anymore, but many other trainings that our clients are looking for, let's say, for example, I mean, we're not doing HubSpot training, right? It's a CRM, but like many people in the U.S. use HubSpot. Now, we happen to already actually, this is a bad example, but we have a lot of people who know HubSpot in Latin America. Uh, but let's say, you know, some other software like QuickBooks, QuickBooks, uh, accounting wise. Now, some people who have worked with QuickBooks in the U.S., or work with American companies, even in the real Latin America, they're exposed to it. But typically in Latin America, QuickBooks is not a software anybody uses, right? So those types of things, compared to the Philippines, that even if they don't work with them either, they've been working with them for 20 years because they've been working with Americans for so long. Yeah, yeah. What, so what's your model? Because you mentioned you like to work with clients that are really thinking longer term and they integrate their virtual workforce in the same way as their own employees and they treat them well. Is your model to put on a virtual professional and then at some point they convert to an employee with the client or is it more of like no, for the most part they never really convert unless the client wants to really do that for some reason okay. uh, and some of them have and you know there's a buyout fee where you can buy them out of the contract it's after two years they have to work with us for at least two years okay then the client can choose to say hey you know i don't want to work with your company anymore i really really love these people and i'm willing to pay a very high buyout fee on purpose i mean we made it higher purpose so they don't leave us uh but you know the truth is, for the most part, that really does benefit the client because we don't charge anything up front. There's no recruitment fee. There's no set of fees. Some companies charge be- between five hundred to two thousand dollars as our let's call it recruitment fee on top of making money from the hourly or monthly cost of the professional. We don't charge anything up front in terms of a fee. We do charge a deposit, but we give the deposit back. We, you know, we're not analyzing lots of competitors and some of them, you know, charging a thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks on top of the rest, right? So the idea is the client doesn't have any real reason to say no to us because they can try them. And even though the idea and the goal is for them to work long-term, our actual people have been going to them to work with them for more than at least 80 hours total. 
So if you're hiring somebody full time, eight hours is just two weeks. Or if it's part time, you know, it's four weeks. So even though we want them to ideally work out, legally speaking, they're not committing to too much. Yeah. So if it doesn't work out for them, it's better. We'll find them someone else. Do you think taking a deposit, does that, does that limit your opportunity sometimes? Or do you feel like, well, if people are willing to, to deposit, they got stake in the game and we'll, we'll, we'll eliminate the people that really aren't serious? That is exactly what we're doing. And I will tell you a quick short story that when I really started this, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was going to, I was trying to get whoever was willing to work with me naturally. That was tough. Right, right. Uh, but I did say to myself, because I mean, this was six years ago, I'm like, the moment that a third client is going to make me do the work, and not hire. And I would tell them, I'm like, listen, we don't try anything up front, but I want you to be serious. Don't waste my time, you know? I was doing it all on my own. If you're going to not hire someone, then just please don't come. And, you know, it happened first, one time, and it happened twice. And literally when it happened to the third guy, I told him, you know what? I'm both, you know, I'm not really happy that you're not hiring, but the truth is, you are that guy that now thanks to you, every single client for the rest of my entire company will be charged, and I will not be wasting your time. Thank you so much. And, you know, I did that. And I mean, the deposit at the time was 100 bucks, then it became 200 bucks, right now it's 500 bucks. And the truth is, people are still willing to lose 500 bucks because they don't get the deposit if they don't have. If they do, we apply. We probably should increase it to 1,000 bucks. And people are probably going to probably are gonna still pay because they're paying already to our competitors and they don't get it. They don't even get it back as credit. They just get charged 1,000 bucks. Yeah. You know, that's hard. That's a tough business decision. I mean, I love your, the way you explain it and you, you know, you make it sound very easy to do, but as business owners, when we're starting a business, especially we want every opportunity. And, and sometimes we have this minimalist attitude that, wow, if we take a deposit, some people are going to say no. And that means we're losing business. And we're recruiting is notorious though, you know, for working for free and never getting a return. So you've kind of, you've kind of nipped that in the bud, so to speak, but but like you said, you probably are losing occasionally a client to competition. But, but you know what? Even though we are, because now the market has changed already so much from since years ago to now in terms of the virtual workforce, we know that we're actually saving ourselves really both time and money by having that client just not come with us. Because those who already become difficult end up being more difficult, waking more time. I'm not working out long term, which is really not really the ideal client anyway. So yeah, we're like actually... I'm not happy if they're not starting. In fact, the hard part is when they do pay the deposit, they do want to hire and they're still paying the buy. So we have had to actually push some people up and tell them, sorry, you know, it's just not where to work out. And we, please, we're going to give you your money back. We just don't want to work with you. And I mean, that is a very locked place to be that we can now say no to people. But it's, we just now really know that based on how many hundreds or thousands of hires we've done, we know which clients are likely to not work out. Right. Now, when you say they're kind of difficult client, what what are signs of being a difficult client? Is it not paying you? Is it no. having high turnover? What I mean, what are the signs? Usually, they're either not following our process after they understood the process and they need to follow the process. And that's whether, you know, they're not replying on time or they're not, you know, doing what we're asking them to do. I mean, you know, we, I'm all about, as a person, not just professionally, about always giving people the right expectations. So I've made it into the process that clients really need to know upfront exactly what to expect. So there's no surprises, right? So when we tell them exactly what they're going to do and what they're going to get and how much commitment we need from them, right? And they don't do it, then it becomes a problem. Or then if they're starting to basically try to change too many things from how we do things, we know they're going to want to change things with the VA, and they're going to want to change their contract, and they're going to want to change the stuff. And listen, I'm the first guy, but I'm a very difficult client. I will ask a hundred questions before I buy anything that's significant. So I, I'm not against having people ask questions. That's totally okay, and that's our job, right, to answer all the questions. But we usually can tell when people are complicated. For example, recently we met somebody in person, and they started a process. And, you know, we're getting these like super long messages of like, hey, you know, you already told me this, but you're requiring me to make another call. And I already sent you the job description. And then people are not answering me within two days. And like, it's like, oh my God, we just had red flags, you know, showing up everywhere. 
If you're a business owner feeling stuck in your business, overwhelmed, responsible for everything that happens, and working long hours, Tyler helps his clients develop processes, hire high-performing team members, and better understand their financial metrics and numbers to allow for a more predictable, less hands-on business. To schedule a free, no-pressure consultation, head to thinktyler.com and click the meeting button. Tyler would love to see if he can help you work on your business, not in your business. Schedule a consultation today at thinktyler.com. Think life, think success, think business. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Toulousma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Toulousma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on ElectroCast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. ElectroCast. And then people are not answering me within two days and like, it's like, oh my God, we just have red flags, you know, showing up everywhere. Yeah. I don't think you realize how unique it is for you to have such a good business mind in the staffing world. So I don't know if you know, I used to own a staffing firm. I had a part ownership in a staffing firm. I sold it. Got to be pretty big size. It was like $25 million a year in revenue. We had about 150 consultants out in the Bay Area. But the hardest part, I was really more of the financial operational arm of it, the business mind, I'll say, and was to get my the team to think in a business way we always wanted you know the team the sales side of the team always wants to take every job order they always want to work on every client we, you know their mind was you know you'd client would come to you and they wanted to negotiate a great deal to start out with it in the future they would pay us more was the thing they tell you and my thing was no pay us more now and in the future if you turn out you know if we end up doing a lot of business with you we can reevaluate the relationship but it it's just interesting because in our business in that staffing business people will do anything and work for free and not have that business sense. So for you to kind of, I mean, you definitely don't think like a say, which is good. And I mean this in a positive way. You don't think like the true sales guy. You think a lot more. I think it's your marketing mind kicking in. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the truth is, I mean, I guess it's bad to admit it, but like I hate salespeople. I just hate them. And that's why whenever I had to do sales, which I've had to do sales most of my life, I always tried to avoid being that simple salespeople. So then that's kind of how we created our pricing model that we, well, I mean, I guess I decided to not make money percentage-wise from what we charge people because naturally if we charge for something more expensive, I would make more money, which technically could be okay, but I didn't want that to be the case. I wanted people to know that I'm not trying to sell anybody more expensive when we were talking to them and I was consulting them to tell them whether you need an $8 an hour person or a $50 an hour person, wherever you need it, I was going to just give you what you needed, but I was not going to make more money. That's still the case today. Whether you're hiring the lowest level or the highest level, our company takes the same dollar amount that's not percentage wise. Right now, that is a problem that we're going to change it because the math and the profitability is not working out anymore. But definitely, yeah, always trying to make sure people knew that we were just trying to be here to help has been the motto from how I train now the person who's my best friend who's doing the recruitment uh, in terms of our head of director of recruitment. And so, yeah, you know, when he's been actually talking to a lot of clients, he's told me a lot of feedback that. People are totally blown. Like, they're literally almost pushing me away and don't want to sell to me. Like, all these other companies just want to sell me someone immediately, and you're really just trying to help. And when you say it's probably not going to be a good fit, you're like telling me no. And you know how reverse psychology works. And I tell my friend, bro, the moment you're going to tell people you don't want to work with them, the more they're going to want you. And it happens every time. And we're not honestly doing it to try to be like psychology to try to get them, but it's just that we really don't think it's either the right time for them to work with us or not the right fit in general. And they're like, what do you mean? You don't want to work with me? They're like, no, I don't want to work with you. Well, now no, I really want to work with you. Well, you don't want to work with you. Yeah. So yeah, we're definitely not a pushy company. So you pay the virtual professional. Um, they're on your payroll, so to speak. And then your client obviously pays you. Does your client pay you? Like how much arrears does your client pay you before you have to pay the, the virtual professional? Is there a negative cash flow in that? No, I mean, I, I set it up in a way we, we do billing every two weeks. Okay. You get, I mean, we pay the, sorry, we, we charge clients at the end of every two week period, uh, let's say on a Friday. And then, yeah, I, I'm able to get the money by Monday. 
Well, that's huge. So you don't have like a, a lot of times in staffing, one of the biggest challenges is you pay your employees, uh, your staff, and then you don't sometimes get paid from your client until 30, 60 days later. So it sounds like you've got around that. Yeah, we got around that. And, you know, initially I was sending people invoices and they had to pay them when they felt the right time to pay in terms of even if it was due, you know, people never pay on time. Right. So yeah, I took the subscription model and from very early on and said, everything was going to be automated. You can never pay me. You need to give me your payment information and I will always charge you on that. And that's what we did. Yeah, that's great. That Yeah, that's smart. Otherwise, it would be a nightmare. I mean, many, a few hundred people, we didn't have a that model and they were complicated to work with until we said, either you're moving to automatic or I don't care, you're out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it really protects you too because then you're not having to carry this uh, AR. So, okay, that's great. And then what about like, how do you approach from a margin standpoint do you i mean what should the client expect actually let me go here what should the client expect first in terms of obviously from a technical standpoint their expectation is pretty comparable probably yeah. to an american employee what, right. what what should they expect in terms of a, a fee difference in terms of they hired someone in the united states versus someone from latin america so obviously it will depend on the role okay but generally speaking it, it goes from 50 to 70% savings, which is pretty wow. big. Wow. I mean, that, that means you are paying either a third to half the price, sometimes even less than a third. Now, the reality is that in the United States, things have become more and more expensive, definitely in states like California and, you know, New York, you know, on the coast, you know, things to be, tend to be more expensive. But surprisingly, even in states like Florida or Texas, where the minimum wage is lower, people are still struggling to attract the right type of candidates locally in the U.S. So even those clients, like we have so many clients in Texas and Florida. Like so much. I mean, we also have them in California and New York. We have people really all over the place. But to my surprise, because some people, when we were speaking to them initially, were like, well, I'm in Florida. I can just hire somebody for seven bucks an hour. They're like, yeah, to put burgers out of high school, you're not going to get a profession to do your like admin work for seven bucks an hour, right? So yeah, and the truth is, people are saving significantly the amount of money. Now, the truth also, I would say that Things are changing now. We are struggling to attract people because now both there's competition and other competitors are trying to attract people. But for the most part, it's just both the U.S. is becoming more expensive and the entire world is becoming, let's say, due to inflation, more expensive. So what we used to pay six years ago, there's no way we can afford almost to pay anymore. Uh, and right now, the struggle is trying to find the right new pricing so that people are paid the right fair amount that they need and people still find it affordable here. But the reality is that, for example, our company, our lowest price is still eight bucks an hour, which is the same price from six years ago, which we need to, we're in dire need to change, and uh, where most companies are starting at 12 to 15 bucks an hour already, from Latin America. So we're already like half price, which is very bad, which is not really becoming a problem. We need to, and I'm trying with my entire team to find what's going to be the right price to, the right time to really raise it, because it's just no longer being possible. We can't attract people at the lowest page limit. Right, right. It does seem like, too, there's more competition. I, I had someone reach out to me a few weeks ago. He called it Nearshore, his services, and the, his business literally blew up. Like He started it, I think it was a year and a half ago, and he is almost saying no to business. He's getting so much business. And so it's. I think people are kind of here starting, to, I hate to say it, everybody sees their opportunity and everybody jumps on it. No, um, we see it completely. We've been looking, we, we, literally, we literally keep the list in Google Doc of all the competitors we find, not just in Latin America, around the space. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, we actually joke around, but not really joke that every time we go to the restroom and just look at Instagram, there's like a new competitor every time, every right. day, at least right. one. And right. it's almost not a joke, but yeah. yeah, we get four or five competitors a week. One thing I love that you guys do, I'm on your mailing list, I have been for a while. I love how you spotlight educational items and you kind of position yourselves I think in a more, pro I don't know if there's the right terminology, but more professionally than how I generally think of virtual firms is one is that your that's probably your marketing background, but like, what are the, if you can share some of the strategic conversations of like, how do we kind of get viewed a little different than just another virtual company? I mean, there are some companies that are doing the same as ours in terms okay. of training the people. In fact, this is kind of a struggle for me. So I'll tell them, we do have now what's called a virtual Latinos Academy. Okay. So it is something that we launched about this point, probably nine months ago. Uh, it is something that was a project that I 
started in 2021, but it really took a long time to launch it in the first course. So the idea is really to invest in training our professionals before they get hired or if they're already hired so that they're more ready to actually work with our customers uh, once they are ready. Now, those are, let's say, courses that we're creating that are not obviously a university degree, right? But they are courses that can take anywhere between four hours to 20 hours to complete. And there's a different amount of topics. But yeah, the idea is really to invest in our people because that is some of the things and comments we've been seeing from our clients. that you know, even though they're great people, they're professional, they have a degree, they're detail-oriented, they wish they had some some additional, let's say, technical skills, right? So that's the gap that we're trying to fill by doing that. Now, even though we're doing that with the virtual professionals, we haven't fully, crazily promoted it to the clients. And I'm a little bit on purpose because we haven't gotten negative feedback from clients working with the competition who claim, hey, for example, we work a lot in the legal space with a lot of lawyers. And many of our competitors say, like, we have legal assistants that are trained to work with lawyers. So we have fintech specialists who are trained. And like they claim that they're all these people that are trained. And I'm a guy who hates BSing people and not giving them the right expectation. And that's been part of also our success. We kind of undersell and over deliver. And so when people, of course, are, if I were to start calling, hey, we have people that are trained in X, Y, or Z skills, and then people hire them, they're like, well, they're not really skilled. They just took a course. So we've been struggling with what exactly to call these people who have completed a certification, which is kind of what we're calling them now, right? They've completed a certification in the Virtual Legal Academy. We are completely avoiding using the word these people are trained because that usually makes the connotation that like, these people really know how to do something. And it's not that we're not trying to have the skills, but you know, you know, skills take time. Just taking a course is not going to make you an expert, right? So I've been really careful with how do we promote that because now we've had that feedback from other people. And we've seen also our competitors in person at the trade shows. Oh, these people are trained on this and on that. And then some clients who walk around like, you know, you guys don't claim to train anybody. I'm like, we don't. I mean, there's courses, people take them, and they're really great, but you're going to train them. That's your job, right? And they're like, okay, well, that's weird. I want to hire somebody that's trained. I'm like, yeah. And look, there's a bunch of courses we offer them, but like, the truth is, I would lie to you if they're really trained as you think, that you really want to train them. So, yeah, that's a balance that we're trying to, to do. But actually train them without claiming that they're trained. Yeah, I think, you know, you just said a few things that are just such awesome business principles. I mean, you talked about, you know, setting expectations, which is huge. I think we sometimes as business owners forget to do that, set realistic expectations. But I also like the whole um, undersell and over deliver. I think that's another thing we sometimes try to, we end up overselling and under delivering unintentionally, but we do, especially in staffing and recruiting. This happens a lot, you know, oh, we'll have a candidate next week. And then it's like three weeks later and you don't have anybody and you just kind of, you know, the the individual just goes, oh, this is another staffing firm that over over promises and doesn't deliver. So it's cool that you kind of think about those things and run your business that way. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I myself have zero recruitment background or HR, but yeah, trying to do my best just from the purely, you know, what I would literally like against a typical philosophical saying, do to others as you'd like to be done to you, right? So, you know. That's true. That's a good one. Hey, what what advice would you give? Because you know you've had a it sounds like you've had a handful of different business experiences, and you you've grown businesses. That's awesome. You, you're in a tough competitive. You're going through some trans, transition now, where it sounds like you're in a lot more competitive environment. What are some tips and advice that you could share with like entrepreneurs that have worked for you? Anything stand out? Yeah, I mean, so I think the biggest mindset thing. Um, which differentiates some of our clients from others is really the fact that when people are outsourcing to us or near sharing, they don't think of these people just as cheap labor to save money. Now, again, it's not that you're not trying to save money. Yes, you're trying to save money. But what people have, when like the really best client, and I don't mean best in terms of, oh, they make me the most money, but best in terms of how they treat the people that they hire from us, the relationship that we have with them, are those that are hiring people from Latin America and really considering them just equals to the people in the US, like I mentioned earlier. And that really means both treating them, like I said, correctly, but for example, also offering people bonuses, offering people raises, offering people what we call perks, which are not really benefits, but other ways to give people extras. And so when those people are treated the same as the people in the US, then those relationships with those people truly are very strong and they are going to be long lasting. And that's the most important part. So 
And, you know, when we're now talking to clients and we see that all they want to do is save money, we literally tell them, like, we're just not the cheapest company. Go hire people somewhere else. It's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. Go find something cheap if that's what you're looking for. But, and, you know, those are the types of people that when we tell them, listen, you know, you get what you pay for and you already know there's nothing new, but, you know, if you're really looking to do X or Y, we need to make sure that these people are going to be part of your team. You're going to give them an email address for your company and you're going to treat them humanely like everybody else. So that's the biggest tip. And many people that are starting out in this, they're like, okay, I have my team here, or maybe they don't have any team, and I just need some people to do cheap labor. They're not going to be the face of my company. Like, I don't want them to necessarily, let's say, talk to my clients because either their English is going to suck or it's not going to be as great. But when you really have that nice internship that people in Latin America are very professional, many of, have, many of them do have amazing English skills. And, you know, this is now like accepting the new world of how the world is working is, I guess, the main tip. We're already working in a global world. You just have to embrace it, you know. Do you find, so I think it's really cool that it sounds like you coach your clients to some degree in terms of, hey, this is how we really want you to take care of our virtual professionals. Now, is that also become a competitive benefit in terms of when you're working with the virtual professionals and say, hey, look, we really, we're going to bring you into clients that we're going to try our hardest because obviously you don't control it, but we're going to try our hardest to bring you into environments where you're treated with respect and you're valued as an employee. And we're not going to oversell your skills because I'm sure there's a lot of that happens where, you know, it's just the cheapest price and they get them in and then they get treated not very well. So it sounds like you're kind of creating a win-win for really both sides. Right now, our contracts actually don't force anybody to give any bonuses or raises. Like we always say that those are optional. That's not until now. But now we know that other people do put it into their contract that after a year, like you're going to be out of matter and charge the rain because that's just how it works. And you're like, we were already signing it. So that is where we're going to want to get our company to uh, more away from the freelancing paper hour, paper project. I mean, we've never done paper project, right? But get away from that mindset of people hiring just for cheap labor project based something quick and more as, you know, these are long term people and we're going to have to. We are going to change that into our agreements in the future. We're not sure exactly when, where we will be able to promise our people, hey, after a year, you will get a raise, or after X, you will get some benefit, uh, what you are calling on first. But right now, no, we can't, we don't, uh, but we know that we now need to. Does cash flow have you down? Profit, not where you think it should be? Maybe it's the long hours. Let's meet to see if I can help. I bridge driving the financial performance of your business to hit growth and success targets. Book a complimentary meeting at meetforgrowth.com to get started now. Once again, that's meetforgrowth.com. I look forward to talking with you. And thanks for listening to the show. Or after X, you will get some benefit, uh, what you were calling on birds. But right now, no, we can't, we don't. Uh, but we know that we now need to. But it does still sound like you do try to set up a good ex- a good experience for the professional. Right. And we do have actually something called like Virtual Latinos Perks, which are two different uh, programs that we've already established and we market it to our clients as add-ons that they can pay for extra and 100% of that get just paid extra to the VAs, whether it's like paying for our, like a portion of their health insurance or a portion of their internet bills or stuff like that. So we standardize that and we promote it to our clients and, you know, the majority has not, but many of them do say, sure, charge me an extra X bucks a month, and that gets directly sent to them. We don't keep any part of that. We also still don't ever keep any percentage of any bonuses or raises. So any raise that you give to the VA or any bonus, 100% of that is given to them. We don't make any more money. Yeah, that's great. That's Yeah, that's a really nice perk that you guys give to them. Now, one other question. You had started out with, uh, I think you said, 5 to 15 employees was like the typical client that would be ideal for you. Do you ever think about maybe focusing to businesses that are a little bit bigger that that might have more opportunity or are they harder to get into or what's your thoughts around that? We do have bigger clients that hire between 50 to 100 people, uh, uh, a single company. They're not many. It's definitely the least amount of our clients. Our average client hires close to two people is like 1.8. But you know, what we end up finding is that when companies that are much bigger want to hire, yeah. they either, you know, want to change the terms of the agreement, uh, the way we charge them, or generally speaking, they have too many specific HR, let's call it rules, because this, ha- this did happen to us with an existing client 
at the very early stage, they hired two or three people, and then they they grew up were very way too crazy, way too quickly, and immediately they're like they all gonna be our employees or our virtual contractors, and we have to pay them like everybody else within our payment systems. So we ended up, I think they're no longer clients because we ended up just losing them eventually. But from the moment that they said we went, we want to be able to do X, Y, I said no. Our company was like this. If you want to keep our professionals, you're gonna have to keep paying through us. The buyer fee has to still take two years. And, you know, so bigger companies are not as willing to, let's say, work through an agency, which makes sense, right? They're trying to grow their operations. But the biggest issue is, like, some of the bigger companies, not between 50 to 100, but maybe, I don't know, about 100 to 200 people, they're not going to want to have, let's call it, a middleman like us managing everything. So some of them do, and that's why we have them as clients, because, you know, we manage all the HR, all the payments, they don't have to worry about any of that. And we are, like, their actual recruitment agency that's internal, even though it's external, and we are helping them all the time. We have dedicated success managers that are just working with their account, and they're managing all these people. It's, like, basically... An extra one or two employees that they don't pay for that we pay for it to manage their, you know, their team. Uh, but yeah, working with like much bigger companies, I think that it's harder for those reasons. The legal part, in terms of them wanting to hire the HR parts, and then the other reality that's sad to say that when you get way bigger, then you're thinking a lot more in money, and then they want the cheapest cost for many of the roles, not all of them. And then because this is happening with you know, I can't now we can say cool, but now some companies that are working with us are like growing too much, and they're like, well. Now that we're growing too much, now we're really going to save more money. So they're, now they're like considering the Philippines again, because that's still cheap. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, it sounds like you definitely have your share of challenges in oh, your yeah. business. And I, I sure appreciate how open and transparent you are. So your your website again, and I'll put this in the show notes at thinktyler.com. Your website is virtuallatinos.com. And I'm assuming if people go there, if they were interested in your services, they could probably fill out an intake for, form and just learn more. Uh, about you. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's fair. And there's a lot of information. And then usually the next step, if people are interested, we book a 15-minute call with our, our recruitment team. So then you can actually learn about the details of how it works, uh, the whole roadmap of hiring with us and what to expect or not expect from us. Very cool. Hey, well, thanks so much for being on the show. I, I really appreciate transparency was cool. Your wisdom was cool. I think you're doing a lot of things that, uh, you know, sometimes we're scared to do as business owners, but that's what takes it, it takes to build great companies. So it sounds like you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me in the show. I appreciate it. Okay. Take care. You too. That's all for this episode of Think Business with Tyler. But we have plenty more resources to help you in your pursuit of business excellence on our website at thinktyler.com. If you'd like to be featured in a future episode of the show, feel free to reach out to us on social media at think underscore Tyler. We look forward to helping you think life, think success, and think business.